we have to learn about the meaning of time. This is Lee Smolin. Moses, thank you. Thank you for having me. Are you going to explain how this started with Jaron, or we're just going to forget about it? We're just going to, we're going to explain it. We're going to say that this was originally supposed to be a duo with my dear friend Jaron Lanier, who unfortunately couldn't be here, but you'll... Here you are. Here I am. All right. Here I am. Lee Smolin is from the famous, fabulous Perimeter, Perimeter Institute, Institute. For Theoretical Physics. And what an act to follow. <laughs> Now you're all warmed up and you're ready to go from yoga to thinking about the most abstract and most pervasive, the most abstract concept and the most pervasive aspect of our experience, which is time. There we are. I'm a theoretical physicist. As Moses said, I came to Canada 10 years ago to help start the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics where we think about the most fundamental aspects of the world. What is space? What is time? What is law? What is matter? And I want to talk to you about the hardest and most interesting of those questions, which is what is time. And my purpose is not to impress you, is not to wow you with some science fiction thing about multi-universes or anything like that. It's to tell you about the questions that we ask and what I want to communicate by telling you about some of the questions that we're asking these days in science is how the most abstract and fundamental concepts at the root of our thought affect how we think about everyday life. But I'm not going to mention much everyday life. I'm going to try to be evocative and ask you to think, when I mention scientific questions, how the answer to those questions affects you and affects how you think about the most basic things and the most personal things, as well as things like how to make a society that Patry was telling us about. So let's start with the first question. Is time real? Or is it, as many religions and many philosophers, many philosophies teach, an illusion? The most, that's the most important question facing theoretical physics right now. And let's start by asking you guys, can we have a vote? How many people think time is an illusion? And how many people are convinced time is the least illusional thing we know about, is the most real and least illusional thing we know about? Okay, so it's about half and half. Now, the reason why this is an interesting question is that most of us, if you think about it, have a paradoxical relationship with an attitude towards time because we all live in the moment. We all experience everything we experience is in a moment which is one of a succession of moments. Everything we think, everything we feel is in a moment. Every memory is a memory of a moment. Yet if you think about what's most valuable for you, what you most value, what you most esteem, we have a habit of putting what we most value and what we most esteem outside of time. Mathematical truth is outside of time, is timeless. Morality is outside of time. If you're a believer, God or some conception of God is outside of time. And so the next question, just to take one of those things that we esteem truth, if you believe something is true, is it timeless? Does making something true, 2 plus 2 equals 4, is that outside of time? Or is it something which is true in the moment of the experience and asking and always true because it's true in each moment? I'm not going to have you vote on each one of these, but I want you just to think about the question. Now, physicists, what we most esteem is laws of nature. We see our lives as dedicated to the search for laws of nature. So, if laws of nature are the most fundamental thing, perhaps if time is an illusion, time emerges from law. Perhaps laws of nature come first, and time is something which emerges, like heat, like light, like so many things which are not really fundamental that have to do with our experiences, large, big animals in the world. Okay. Or, Maybe time is the most fundamental thing and law emerges from time. 
Maybe the laws of nature are caught in time the way that all of our lives are. And when you think about law, law is this funny thing in which, you know, Patri, I was very inspired, was talking about evolving law in society and innovative, innovating and experimenting with law in society. Seeing law in society is something that develops in time. And some of my thinking about laws of nature have come from a collaboration with a political philosopher and theorist, the Brazilian philosopher Roberto Mangiabera Unger, um, who I just dropped to drop a name, which is an inspiration for me. But there is a relationship between thinking about law as law in society and law as laws of nature. And you can think about these questions both in both respects. Now, one of the most mysterious aspects of time is the future. And we all think about the future. There was the session about aging, which is our concern with our own futures the concern with the future of the planet, climate change, and so forth. Basic question about the future. Okay. If time isn't real, if you're one of these people who believes that time is an illusion, then what is the future? Is the future already determined? Do you think, when you think about the future, that are you one of these people who's a fatalist that well, it's bound, it's all set up, it's bound, what's going to happen is bound to happen, it's already determined. Or is the future open? And I'm speaking as a person, but I'm also speaking as a scientist, as you'll see in a minute. If the future is open, is novelty possible? There's this idea of science explains everything in terms of laws, then how could anything new ever happen? Because it's, things are just... Time is just the rearrangement of atoms. Nothing is really happening but atoms moving around, in which case nothing new can ever happen. Most of my scientific colleagues believe something like what I just said. But we see novelty all the time in the evolution of the universe, in the appearance of galaxies, stars, planets, life, everything up to including everything that we experience each day is novel in the universe. Is that a real aspect of reality or is it an illusion? Another way to say that is that if you knew everything it was to know about the present, could you ever be surprised about what would happen in the future? And again, these are questions, I could translate them into the language of mathematical physics and they would be questions on the forefront of mathematical physics. Talking about law, Another question, and I'll just let you ramify this to your personal concerns, but another question we worry about as cosmologists is if we take the laws that we know apply to things in the universe, atoms, molecules, elementary particles, do they scale up to explain the whole universe? Or are there new laws which are coming into play at the level of the universe as a whole? And now, just to go into the personal with the same questions, because again, what I'm interested in communicating is how these scientific philosophical questions also ramify for how we think about ourselves and our personal lives. And by that I mean, if there is a scientific revolution that establishes that time is real, or if there is a revolution that establishes that time is an illusion, how we think about our human lives will change. Okay. So, part of is time real, is the future open? Again, we had the session on aging. And for me, it's not just about living as long as possible, it's what it means to live longer. Do we have more freedom as we get older, or are our lives more constrained as we get older? That's a question about is the future open? I tried this out on a bunch of 20-some artists once at a gig I had to do, and they didn't know what I was talking about. On the societal level, what's the wise response to the threats of climate change and other threats that are 50 years, 100 years, 200 years in the future? How do we think about the future? Do we think about the future as determined, as open? Okay, all these questions are tied together. Now, a lot of people are turned off to science. And I've asked, as a scientist and as somebody who's very interested in publicizing science and communicating about science, I've tried to understand why so many people are turned off to science. And 
a thing that I've understood is that the picture of the world that science has taught is unattractive. It feels, the universe that physicists describe feels inhospitable to many of us. And one of the reasons is that the picture of nature as made up, as reduced to the interactions of atoms, doesn't leave a place for human meaning, for desire, for pleasure, for intention, for consciousness. And this is this old-fashioned picture that nothing happens in the world except atoms flying around. And if the laws of physics that describe how those atoms fly around and interact are deterministic, as Newton's laws were, okay, then the future is completely determined. Whatever you think you experience about making a choice, it's not really true, you don't really make a choice. It's just those atoms and the chemicals moving around. Free will is impossible. And this used to be the standard picture that physics taught about what was fundamentally true, and no wonder people rejected it. Well, that kind of scientific fatalism is no longer, let alone on personal or philosophical grounds, it's no longer scientifically very convincing. And the reason is that it leaves big questions unanswered. And I want to tell you about some of those questions. If the claim is if you know the laws of nature, you can predict the future and everything is determined. But why are certain laws true and not others? You see, physics is undergoing a sea change because we used to think our job was to find out what the laws of nature are. And we're not quite done, but we're pretty far down the line to finding out what the laws of nature are. And another kind of question has reared its head, oh my God, why are those the laws? Rather than other laws, we can imagine lots of different laws. Why are the particular laws that our experiments discover are true, true? And just saying that nature is deterministic doesn't address those questions. Not only that, if everything evolves from earlier states of the world, what began things? The universe started, quote, at the Big Bang, allegedly. Okay, it started in some state, in some configuration. What chose that first state of the universe? Again, within the standard framework of physics, there's no way to answer that question. Now, it turns out that this worry about the explanation of physics running out has been expressed and expressed for a long time. The American philosopher Charles Sandrick Peirce, and I'm not going to read the quote, but in the 1890s, he said what I just said. And he went on to say that just to say what the laws of nature are doesn't explain anything because you have to explain why those are the laws. And he went on to say the only possible way of accounting for, of explaining why certain things are true, why Newton's law is true, why the laws of electricity are true, why the laws of gravity are true, is that they are the result of evolution, which means laws change. And if laws change over cosmological time, then there's a whole other story which we've just begun to explore. How do laws change? What selects the laws? And that's what a lot of my friends in physics and cosmology are starting to grapple with. Now, there are other reasons why the picture is breaking down. Quantum mechanics itself is not deterministic, and quantum mechanics is the most true law we have. And I'm going to go a little bit faster so I have good time at the end. To talk about determinism is fine, but determinism only applies to little isolated systems. It doesn't apply to the whole universe. But nothing, everything influences everything else. Everything is connected to everything else. So if you think there are chains of causes that explain everything, you get to the scale of the whole universe, but maybe, as per said, laws are evolving on the scale of the whole universe. So a new viewpoint is developing. And I don't claim that this new viewpoint is true. I don't claim it's compelling, but it's radically different. It's a radically different view of what nature is and how nature works. And it applies a radically different way of thinking about the hospitality of the universe and how we fit into it. Steve Weinberg used to say that the more we know about the universe, the more boring it is, the more, and he didn't say it, but he meant inhospitable. The more foreign to us, the more alienated from us it seems to be. But that's on the old way of thinking about physics is made from absolute laws which are timeless and deterministic and so forth. In this new viewpoint, time is real. 
The flow of time is the most true thing we know. This is, I used to believe that time was an illusion, as do many of my colleagues. Now I think that time is the most real thing we know. Everything else emerges in time, including law, which means that the future really is open. Novelty is real, it happens all the time, and a large part of being human is the ability to invent things that are not just seem new, not just faking new, but are genuinely new. That's a lot of what we are about as human beings. The laws, even the laws of nature, may evolve with the universe. The future is open, the future has yet to be made, and it's not like it's easy to change things. You know, some people in politics talk about, you know, sometimes they, turn about, they talk about turning the rudder to turn the ship of politics. And then people with a little more experience in politics talk about turning the rudder that turns the rudder that turns the ship. Okay. It's not that it's slam bang easy to influence the future, but if you believe the future is open, you can be optimistic about our potential to thrive in the world as it's growing in the future. Now, I should say that most of my physics colleagues who are at the frontiers of physics and cosmology still think that time is an illusion. They think there are an infinite number of universes, they all coexist timelessly, okay? and everything that's true or valuable or lovable about ourself, our existence, and our universe is just an accident. I don't think so. I think that there is the possibility of the development of a scientific theory along the lines I've just been describing. But I'm not here to convince you that that is the right scientific theory. I'm here just, and I hope I've given you a taste of this, to communicate that it matters what science discovers. It matters for everything from how we think about political organization to how we think about the far future of our society to how we think about the most personal questions about the future. So is time real or is time an illusion? The most important thing that we can do as scientists is find out which makes more sense, which fits the evidence better, and I hope I've gotten you interested enough to follow this story. Thank you very much. Okay. Jaron would have been fun also, but I hope that was interesting. It was clear as mud. <laughs> That's fantastic. You don't mean that. No, I was just no. kidding. <laughs> I'll be by the perimeter to help you with those lectures on Monday. Yeah? <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you so That's much. That's good. But I did like the last, the last sentence. Imagination is essential.